All right, so I'm going to uh, talk about a project we did for New Jersey Department of Transportation. Um, they had done some early work with ultra high performance concrete. They were an early adopter of UHPC for connecting gas deck panels and did a million square foot of that on the Pulaski Skyway. They had a lot of success with the, that project and using UHPC for that application. And they wanted to find out, um, you know, they had heard that people were doing UHPC overlays and wanted to evaluate it and decide if it was something they wanted to adopt more widely in their bridge preservation practice. All right. So they wanted a better understanding of the material, how it works, how to design with it, construct it. Um, they wanted to develop standard plans um, de or details, standard specifications, so that they could more widely deploy this. So they, they started out with a project. Initially, there were some other materials that were going to be evaluated as well, so they were thinking about including other um, types of overlays, but eventually they had to work within their financial constraints and decided just to focus the whole project on ultra-high performance concrete. So by a show of hands, how many people here know what UHPC is, is familiar with the material? Okay, about two-thirds, okay. So for real high overview, for those that aren't familiar with UHPC, it's a cementitious composite material um, very high compressive strains, typically greater than 20 KSI in compression, 1 KSI in tension, 2% to 3.5% steel fibers by volume. Um, I've given that the tensile properties, very extremely durable material, excellent bond strength. And those are some of the, the characteristics that really make UHPC an ideal candidate for, for overlay projects because you get that great bond, you have a really good uh, protection of your deck. You can actually strengthen your deck if you need it. So a lot of advantages. I don't want to go too off topic on that, but just to give a high level for those that are not familiar with the material. So as part of this project, they wanted to do evaluations, periodic evaluations, to see how it was performing over time to make sure, sure it looked great when they installed it, but if you go back two years later, you know, years later, we're going to start seeing problems. Is it really going to keep the chlorides out of our deck? Is it going to stay bonded? You know, all of those things were, were you think it's going to do, they wanted us to be able to verify that. So the construction was completed in December of 2020. Beginning of the project, they, they asked us to evaluate a bunch of different parameters. Um, the performance of the overlay on a wide variety of bridges to get a, you know, see not just how does it perform on a simple span steel girder bridge, but how does it perform on a continuous uh, pre-stress girder bridge, for example, um, on an older structure where the deck maybe is starting to deteriorate a little bit versus a, a newer structure where the deck really is, is in pretty good shape, but they just want to be able to extend the, the life of it even further. So we started out with, with um, I think there were eight bridges that were on our sh initial short list. And then because of, of different constraints, four of those were, uh, only four of those were really moved into the final design and construction. So the four bridges you can see here, do I have a pointer? Yeah, well, it's not really, can you see that pointer? Barely. Barely. Anyway, um, so these are the structures that were chosen. So I-295, that's a continuous steel multi-girder, five-span bridge. Uh, New Jersey 57 over Hansbrook. Um, that's a little tiny 25-foot span, single-span pre-stressed adjacent voided slab bridge. I-280 westbound over Newark Turnpike. Um, Three span simply supported steel girders. We got our simply supported steel. We got our simply supported pre stress. You know, et cetera. We can cover all those different attributes so we could evaluate how the UHPC performed on a, a variety of structures. Without getting into a, a ton of on the design side, because the focus of this presentation is really the evaluation side. But so you understand um, a little bit more about the background of the project. Um, in general, when we're trying to do these overlays, we want to maintain the existing top of deck if we can, so we don't have to make any adjustments to the roadway profile leading up to the bridge. And also, it triggers different environmental issues if you change that grading. 
So we wanted to avoid avoid that, and, and uh, if at all possible, we, we were only trying to waterproof the deck. We only needed an inch and a half of UHPC to uh, obtain our our design objective. If we were trying to strengthen the deck, then you might want to go to a thicker overlay. In this case, we're not worried about strength. We're just trying to provide durability. Some of the bridges had an existing asphalt topping. Um, what the standard practice in, in the United States has been with UHPC overlays is that's your final riding surface. You grind it, you groove it, and you drive on it. In Europe, the standard practice is quite different. They place the UHPC, then they put HMA uh, wearing surface, and, and that's the way the Europeans, particularly the Swiss and um, where this is very popular, that, that's what they do. So we decided that we did a couple of bridges with asphalt, and we did a couple of bridges without asphalt. Um, and the reason we chose asphalt or not asphalt was what was out there existing. We didn't want to take out, um, you know, two inches of asphalt, another inch of concrete, and then put in three inches of UHPC. It's not a cheap material. We don't need three inches. We only need an inch and a half. So in, in some cases, we put a thinner overlay and then put asphalt on top of it. When it gets into the evaluation side, that made a lot of challenges for us. So I'm going to talk about some of those challenges I get further into the presentation. And just to, to mention briefly, um, in addition to the overlay itself, we also did the UHPC headers. Um, you can see here, it's also that uh, impact resistance, the ductility, um, really good material for Again, for those who have not seen UHPC before, I will show you this video. And as the video is placed, so one, one thing that I, I want to mention while this is playing, there's basically two versions of UHPC. There's, there's the typical version, which is a self-leveling, self-consolidating material that's typically used for joint fills. It's very flowable, castable. And if, you, if you're putting it into a formwork, that's great. When I take that material, I try to put it on as an overlay on a... Um, bridge deck, it would all end up in my gutter line because I always have a profile, I got a cross slope, my bridge is not flat. So the material, I mean, I'm going to see if I can play this again. The material is, it, that we use on a bridge deck is called thixotropic and it's a non-Newtonian Newtonian fluid, so, which means when you add energy to it, it will become flo flowable. When the energy goes away, it stiffens up. So when that vibrating screed goes over it, it vibrates, it adds energy flows, takes the shape of the screed, the screed passes by, it thickens up, and will hold the grade. We placed this with adjacent uh, traffic on this, this project with no issues from vibrations. I, I didn't include that video in this presentation, but I have another one, you know, we're, we're watching them pour the UHPC and there's, there's you know, 18-wheel trucks driving by in the next lane. Um, no, no issues from, from, from that. It's a question we always get. Um, real quick, um, because I'm going to show you the NDE of this later, so I wanted to present the, the joint detail. And, you know, when you're doing an overlay, you almost always have, you can't close many bridges and detour them, so you end up with a longitudinal joint you're doing in stages. This is a detail that was um, adapted from a, a Swiss standard detail. And the idea here is to... Um, Make sure that that joint is not the weakest part of the overlay. You're spending all that money on this impervious overlay, and you have a leaky longitudinal joint. You know, your deck underneath this is going to corrode. You have a weak link. So this detail has a step in it, and I wish I had my, a better pointer, but I don't. Um, but I think you can, can see the detail. So you pour half of it with the step. You have a rebar. Rebar um, is there, particularly if you have any structural loads. It's optional if it's in a not in a negative moment region to put the bar. We like to do it anyway. It adds a dollar or two per linear foot to get this detail versus a very simplified detail. We also did belts and sus um, suspenders. We did an exposed fiber finish. You put a set retarder on the form. Once you get an initial set of the material, come back with a power washer, expose the fibers. UHPC grabs the fibers that are exposed, and the you know, fresh and the hardened UHPC are now bonded together. Uh, through those fibers. And the final uh, reason for the step is if your rebar wasn't enough, your exposed fibers weren't enough to keep the, the thing from going, now your water has to go down, over, and down. So you've made that 
uh, path through any, any chlorides, getting to your um, substrate concrete even further. All right, so what I really want to focus on, that I give you some, some background on the project, we selected two, two of those bridges to do the annual assessments on. Uh, we would have liked to have done all the bridges. There's always budgetary constraints. <laughs> so it's all right, we'll do one with an overlay and one without an, an asphalt overlay. So um, on the left is the 295 bridge over Mantua Creek. And on the right is the 159 bridge. 295 has an asphalt overlay. Uh, 159 is a bare deck. So what kind of testing did we do? We wanted to, again, evaluate the, the main things that we were concerned about, which were, were the bond behavior, um, the ability to keep the chlorides out. And we evaluated that using a combination of impact echo, ultrasonic shear wave tomography, often called MIRA, pull-off testing following ASTM C1583, and we did chloride profiles ASTM C1152, which I think are the, these um, acid-soluble chlorides. We took the chloride samples at about half inches, one half inch into the UHPC overlay, and then one inch below um, the overlay in the underlying concrete to see what, what that chloride profile was looking like. Are we keeping those chlorides out of our substrate? I'm not going to get into a, a ton of details on the, on the technologies. I, I think these are all pretty well known, but just very brief overview. Impact Echo is a very simple test. I got a, an impactor. You can see a person holding their hand, connected up to a computer. Impact the concrete. Wave bounces down. It hits off um, a delamination. It re reflects back, the solid concrete reflects off the back wall and comes back, or the bottom of the deck in this case. So we could see if there was any shallow delaminations that we could associate with debonding of the, the uh, UHPC. We show up very clearly using this technique. It's, it's very quick, very efficient, but only spot coverage. Yeah, we're doing, I think we did a two foot by two foot grid. So, you know, not, there's a lot of stuff you couldn't miss. They give you a pretty good idea of what was going on. In certain other uh, representative areas, we, we used the ultrasonic shear wave tomography. Um, and this particular one is a Mira Pro 3D. So it's got 16 channels. Each channel has four transducers. And they fire off in a sequence. So if you look at the white lines in the image on the left, the first transducer sends out a shear, uh, a shear wave, bounces off and reflects. And all the other 15 sensors are receivers at that point. Then you get the yellow lines. This, the second one would then fire off, and then same thing happens. So you, you have a whole sequence of each transducer provides a signal and then receives what the others receive it. We can then take all those individual um, scans, combine them together um, using SAFT C to make a 3D representation of the deck. Here's an example test plan. And what we were doing, you know, we didn't have enough uh, time and budget to do the entire deck, so we focused on certain areas we thought were, were most critical. So one was at the, the red square, kind of horizontal squares at the center line. That's where that joint is. We wanted to see how that joint was performing. We've got some uh, areas over the pier um, where we have negative moment, where you have a lot of tensile stresses, so we wanted to evaluate those areas as critical. Um, and then at the ends of, of the uh, deck, where you've got a lot of impact loop. The green areas are where we did the pull-off testing and the coring. And the reason we didn't do them in the same area, because they had to be done at the, in, at the same time in the same lane closing. And if you're doing cores and you have a lot of water for your cores, you can't be doing all these other tests at the same time. So that's why we kind of separated the two. All right, moving on to some, some of the example results. How am I doing? Draw it out. <laughs> we have, we have uh, at least one, of, one other presenter that's not here today, so they said I could take a little bit longer. <laughs> All right, so um, 
Here's two examples. I want to point out one of the challenges with the impact echo testing with this, this um, particular <laughs> technique. So with impact echo, if I go back a slide or two, I, I wish I, I should have provided a closer up image of that impact. It's a, it's a little tiny ball about a quarter inch in diameter. And when we use that on a deck that's ground and grooved, like on the right, you, you do, it's hard to get a really good clean signal because the impactor's falling into the groove sometime and not falling into the groove. You get scattering of this, um, the shear weight of the stress waves. So on the right, you can, you can see at, at six, uh, that's the, the bottom of the deck, reflection turn at the bottom of the deck. Um, you can see that you're mostly seeing that, but you see a lot of noise in the middle. On the left is the bridge that had the asphalt overlay. So a nice clean image there. Um, you know, you don't have nearly as much noise. But the challenge there is when, we, when, you, when you have warm asphalt, it's very soft. And we tried to do this initially in, in um, I think it was May, and we ended up out there on a day that decided it wanted to be 90 degrees. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you, you, there's not enough energy, it just dissipates in that very soft asphalt. So we reschedule and go back. You know, when it was cold weather to, to redo that. Um, when the asphalt was nice and cold and we had a 45 degree day, we got really good um, results with the impact echo testing. All right, moving on to the, the mirror. I want to look at a couple different th things here because this is the same location but slicing it and dicing it. We, we had this 3D reconstruction I mentioned us using that, that SAFT program. And you can see here, we had that joint detail with the little short dowel bars, right? They weren't, they were uh, about three foot long. So when you look at the uh, C-scan on the bottom left, you can see the limits of those bars where they, you know, each bar is stops at that location. And you can see on the top uh, where they are in the B-scan. So if I keep moving down in my scan, now I get to the primary transverse bars in the deck. And you see those bars go right out of the, the limits of the scan because they're continuous bars. That's what you would expect. So we got very clear images here. Um, what we did find, you know, when we looked at a bunch of different samples, what we were looking for it was also any kind of discontinuities. Was there issues consolidating the UHPC around these, these dowel bars and forming it down into this steps, you know, shape? Was that creating any issues? So, in a few isolated locations, we did find that there were some discontinuities, likely some voids, you know, honeycombing uh, around, lack of good consolidation around those bars. Um, but not so much that we were really concerned about it. You still had plenty of UHPC cover. You still had um, a good bond. So um, there's a bubble in the middle of my UHPC. I don't really get all excited about it. But you know, these were the kind of things we wanted to evaluate and advise NJDOT on, is this something we maybe want to change that detail or, or not, right? Um, Pull-off testing, this is the result of one bridge. So A is, is a failure in the substrate. What we always want is um, our, our overlay, when you pull on it, that the bond tensile strength is greater than the tensile strength of the substrate concrete. So anything labeled an A failure is what you see on the right where it's aggregate. Uh, clearly seen on the bottom of that sample. That means we're, we're pull, pulling off the underlying concrete. <clears throat> D is a, an epoxy failure. So it's a failure of the adhesive that you're pulling on. So it doesn't really mean that's what the bond stress is. These numbers were, were really pretty you know, varied. Um, I guess it, when you, once you do this hydro demolition surface, it you know, creates a lot of undulations. And it's not a flat, nice, flat, smooth surface. So I think that skews the results a little bit. But we, got, we were satisfied primarily that we were getting that type A failure mode. Fluoride testing, the sample I'm showing here is the 295 bridge where we had the asphalt overlay. So what we would do is we take one sample, um, half a shell, and the other sample is obviously it was in the sample used for fluoride testing. It was nice and dry, so I grabbed and had this bit of flex. Anyway, um, anybody's looking at it saying, how the heck did you get that chloride sample an inch below the center base here? It's not enough concrete. Well, if you're right, <laughs> I tricked you a wrong image. <laughs> anyway, um, so 
bottom line, within the UHPC, I mean, that's trace levels of chlorides, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, you know, that's in any, any concrete when you uh, mix it. Um, one inch below the surface. Now, this particular bridge was an older bridge, and, you know, we knew it was, was um, in need of, of some preservation actions to keep it from deteriorating further. So, generally accepted when you talk about um, pounds per cubic yard of chlorides. Anywhere, anything above two pounds per cubic yard is where chloride uh, corrosion can initiate. And you can see two of the three um, samples we took here were above that threshold. And one of them was just slightly below it. So what we want to see, though, is over time, when we go back and look at this sample a year later, in theory, the chlorides are going to continue to diffuse uh, within that concrete. And if there's no new cl uh, chlorides coming in from the top, we've cut that off with the UHPC, these numbers should start to go down over time. So we'll, we'll see in, in a year or so, maybe I'll do a follow-up presentation, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, anyway, so my last, my last slide, um, the conclusions of, of this work, um, the mirror and impact echo testing showed that we had a very strong bond between the UHPC and the substrate. One strength test data demonstrates that the bond was achieved. Um, chloride content is also within um, expectations of what we, we knew was going to be in the base concrete and what we expected to see in the UHPC. And our baseline testing was successful with no significant defects encountered um, within either of those two evaluations. We are going to continue to do this monitoring for another two year, at least two year period. We'll see if they want to continue after that. Or our current contract is for two years. Um, we're happy to keep going as long as they want. <laughs> but anyway, um, that's it for my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions.